Welcome to the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the second quarter of 2023. Welcome to lesson number five, ready for teaching on April 29. The Good News of the Judgment is the title of this lesson, written by Pastor Mark Finlay, and your reader is Dr. Percy Harold. It's from the series Three Cosmic Messages. Sabbath afternoon, April 22. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, We thank you as we study this lesson about the good news of the judgment, that we can look to Jesus as the author and the finisher of our faith, and that we can trust that what he has done for us clears us for the judgment when we accept him. And as we open your word this week, we pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us and bless us. Bless us in our study, but also bless us in our daily life as we interact with people around us, and bless us in our families. And today I'd like to pray for those who are listening in Armidale in Western Australia, in Coorumbong in New South Wales, and in Vercargill in New Zealand. And from Kenya there's Domitila, and St Vincent and Grenadine there's Roger. And from Belize, there's Terry. And in Las Vegas, there's Dolores. And from South Africa, there's Addis. And Betty Ann from Trinidad and Tobago. And Radlin. I don't know where you're from, Radlin, but I'm praying for you today. And also for Marissa Claire Wilson. Wherever you are, even if I haven't called your name, please know that God appreciates your ability to study his word, your concern for salvation of yourself and for others, and for the praise that you bring to him. Bless each of us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Revelation chapter 14 and verse 7, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and springs of water. Let's read that again, Revelation 14, verse 7. Saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and springs of water. If the Bible was ever clear about anything, it's clear that God is a God of judgment, and that sooner or later, in one way or another, judgment, the judgment so lacking here and now, is going to come and be administered by God himself, the judge of all the earth, as we read in Genesis 18.25, and we'll also look at Psalm 58 and Psalm 94 and Psalm 98. Or as Paul himself has written, so then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. And so for those texts, Genesis 18 verse 25, far be it from you to do such a thing as this, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous should be as the wicked, far be it from you, shall not the judge of all the earth do right. And Psalm 58 verse 11, so that men will say, surely there is a reward for the righteous, surely he is God who judges in the earth. And Psalm 94 verse 2, rise up, O judge of the earth, render punishment to the proud. And Psalm 98 verse 9, before the Lord, for he is coming to judge the earth. With righteousness he shall judge the world and the people's with equity. Scary thought, isn't it? Having to give an account of ourselves before God, the God who knows the deepest things, the God who will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil, as it says in Ecclesiastes 12.14. Yet, ultimately, the judgment reveals the goodness and the grace of God, and that he is both just and merciful in how he deals with the saved and even with the lost. This week, we will explore the deeper themes of the judgment in relation to the great controversy raging in the universe, and we will look especially at what happens when God's faithful people themselves face the inevitable, as it says in Acts 24.25, judgment to come. (music) 
Sunday, April 23, The Significance of the Judgment Hour. The Bible's last book, Revelation, focuses on the culmination of the age-long controversy between good and evil. Lucifer, a rebel angel, challenged the justice, fairness and wisdom of God. He claimed that God was unfair and unjust in the way that he administered the universe. Revelation's final judgment is at the very centre of this conflict over the character of God. Revelation 14 verse 7 reads, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. Why is it significant that right after we are told about the everlasting gospel, the first angel's message mentions God's judgment? What does the everlasting gospel have to do with God's judgment? The gospel and the judgment, both parts of the first angel's message, are inseparably intertwined. Were it not for the everlasting gospel, we would have no hope in the judgment. In fact, as we will see, the everlasting gospel is indeed our only hope in the judgment. There is no question that part of the content of the gospel is the announcement of judgment. During this judgment, the unfallen worlds will see that God has done everything he can to save every human being. This judgment reveals God's justice and mercy. It says something about his love and law. It speaks of his grace to save and his power to deliver. The judgment is part of God's ultimate solution to the sin problem. In the great controversy between good and evil in the universe, God answered Satan's charges on the cross. But in the judgment, he reveals that he has done everything possible to save us and to lead us to the cross. Heaven's infinite, minute, exact, detailed records will be opened. As we see in Daniel 7 verse 10, a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him, ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him, the court was seated, and the books were opened. We are so precious to God that the entire universe pauses to consider the choices we have made in light of the wooing of the Holy Spirit and the redemption so freely provided by Christ on Calvary's cross. And so to finish today, read Psalm 51 verses 1 to 4 carefully, especially verse 4. How do these verses help shed light on the meaning and purpose of the judgment? Psalm 51 beginning at verse 1. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness. According to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. And verse 4, Against you, you only have I sinned, and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak, and blameless when you judge. Monday, April 24, God's Mercy and Judgment The cross and judgment both reveal that God is just and merciful. The broken law demands the death of the sinner. Justice declares the wages of sin is death. Mercy responds in Romans 6.23, The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. If God's law could be changed or abolished, it would be totally unnecessary for Jesus to die. Christ's death establishes the eternal nature of the law, and the law is the basis of judgment. Read Revelation chapter 20 and verse 12. How are we judged? What relationship do our good works have to our salvation? Revelation 20 Verse 12, And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. 
Our works reveal our choices and our loyalty to God. According to Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9, By grace you have been saved through faith, not works, lest anyone should boast. But when Christ saves us, he changes us, because verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Our good works, empowered by the Holy Spirit, do not save us, but they do testify that our faith is genuine. God's final judgment strips away all pretense, all hypocrisy, all falsehood, and pierces into the very depth of our being. In depicting our position before God in the judgment, Ellen G. White provides this powerful insight into how the gospel and judgment go hand in hand. The fact that the acknowledged people of God are represented as standing before the Lord in filthy garments should lead to humility and deep searching of heart on the part of all who profess his name. We read in Testimonies for the Church, volume 5, pages 471 and 472. The quote continues, Those who are indeed purifying their souls by obeying the truth will have a most humble opinion of themselves. The more closely they view the spotless character of Christ, the stronger will be their desire to be conformed to his image, and the less will they see of purity or holiness in themselves. But, while we should realise our sinful condition, we are to rely upon Christ as our righteousness, our sanctification, and our redemption. We cannot answer the charges of Satan against us. Christ alone can make an effectual plea in our behalf. He is able to silence the accuser with arguments founded not upon our merits, but on his own. End of quote. And so to finish the day, how do you see in her words the inseparability of the gospel from the judgment? What hope can you take away from this link between the gospel and judgment for yourself? Tuesday, April 25, A Magnificent Scene The prophetic books of Daniel and Revelation are companion volumes pointing us to the unfolding events in the last days of Earth's history. The book of Revelation announces that the hour of God's judgment has come. The book of Daniel reveals when the judgment began. In Daniel 7, God revealed the history of the world to the prophet. Nations rise and fall, persecuting powers oppress the people of God. After describing Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, the breakup of the Roman Empire, and the persecution of the church for the 1,260 years predicted in the text, God focuses Daniel's mind on a glorious celestial event that will set all things right. And we're pointed here to Daniel 7.25, He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time, and times, and half a time. And Revelation 12 verse 14, But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness to her place, where she was nourished for a time, and times, and half a time, from the presence of the serpent. The prophet's attention is directed from the rise and fall of nations and the oppressive powers of earth to the throne room of the universe and God's final judgment when he will right every wrong and establish his everlasting kingdom of righteousness. God took Daniel in prophetic vision from the chaos and conflict of the earth to the glories of heaven's sanctuary and the sitting of the supreme court of the universe where Christ, the rightful ruler of this world, will receive from his Father the kingdom that is rightfully his. Read Daniel chapter 7 verses 9 and 10 and verse 13 and describe what Daniel saw in these verses. What too is the final result of this judgment? Daniel chapter 7 
verses 9 and 10. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire, a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him, ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were opened. And in verse 13, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven, he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Daniel chapter 7 verse 14, Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. Uh, and verses 26 and 27, But the court shall be seated, and they shall take away his dominion, to consume and destroy it forever. Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey him. The destiny of all humanity is decided in heaven's courtroom. Right prevails, truth triumphs, justice reigns. This is one of the most amazing, most marvellous, most spectacular scenes in all of Scripture. And the good news is that it ends very well for God's faithful people, those clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Jesus approaches his heavenly Father in the presence of the entire universe. Heavenly beings crowd in around the throne of God. The entire universe of unfallen beings stands in awe of this judgment scene. The long conflict that has been waged for millennia is soon to be over. The battle for the throne of the universe is fully, completely decided. And so to finish the day, Daniel was right about the empires that came and went, just as predicted. Why then does it make so much sense to trust the word of God about what it says regarding the final one, an everlasting kingdom, that shall never pass away? Wednesday, April 26, A Glimpse of Heaven in Revelation chapter 4, John beholds an open door in heaven and receives the invitation to, as it says in verse 1, Come up here and I will show you things which must take place after this. Jesus invited the apostle to look through the open door in heaven's sanctuary to view eternal scenes in the great controversy between good and evil. We too can look through that open door with John and receive a glimpse of the eternal plan of salvation. We are witnesses of issues that are being decided in heaven's celestial court. Fundamental issues in the great controversy between good and evil develop before our eyes. Read Revelation chapter 4, verses 2 to 4. What similarities can you see here with the judgment seen in Daniel 7? Revelation 4, beginning at verse 2, Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne, in appearance like an emerald. Around the throne were twenty-four thrones, and on the thrones I saw twenty-four elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. This is obviously a throne room scene. God the Father sits upon the throne, surrounded by heavenly beings. There is thunder and lightning, symbolizing God's judgment. We also notice in Revelation 4.4 4, that 24 elders are present around God's throne. Who are these 24 elders? In ancient Israel, there were 24 divisions in the Levitical priesthood. These priests represented the people before God. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, the Apostle declares that New Testament believers are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. 
These 24 elders could, perhaps, represent all the redeemed that one day will rejoice around the throne of God, or perhaps they represent the people resurrected at Christ's resurrection who ascended to heaven with him. As we read in Matthew chapter 27, verse 52, And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised, and Ephesians 4, verses 7 and 8, But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, When he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Either way, this is good news. There are some of the redeemed from the earth around the throne of God. They face temptations just as we face them. Through the grace of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, they overcame. They are clothed in white robes, signifying the righteousness of Christ that covers and cleanses their sins. They have a golden crown upon their heads, signifying that they are victorious in the battle with evil and are part of heaven's royal line of faith-filled believers. We see a throne set in heaven with God sitting upon it. There are heavenly beings around the throne, and soon all of heaven begins to sing, and the crescendo of praise builds higher and still higher. As it says in Revelation 4.11, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honour and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Thursday, April 27. Jesus is worthy. In Revelation chapter 5, verses 1 to 3, once again we see a throne. A scroll is introduced with writing on both sides. It is sealed with the divine seal and no one in heaven or earth can open the scroll. Heavenly beings tremble. The issue is serious. No angelic beings can represent humanity in earth's final judgment. John weeps because no one can open the scroll. Then one of the elders, one of those redeemed from the earth, speaks words of encouragement to John's heart. Jesus, the Lamb of God, is worthy to open the scroll. Let's read Revelation 5, verses 1 to 3. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. John beholds the ultimate answer to the sin problem in Revelation 5.5. Here the aged prophet beholds the only way anyone can pass the final judgment at the throne of God. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll. And I looked, and behold, a lamb as though it had been slain. And that's from Revelation 5, verses 5 and 6. Read Revelation 5, 8 to 12. How does all of heaven respond to the announcement that Jesus is worthy to open the scroll of judgment and redeem us? Revelation 5, beginning at verse 8. Now, when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp, and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints, and they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain. You have redeemed us to God by your blood, out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and have made us kings and priests to our God. And we shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders. And the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive the power and riches and wisdom and strength and honour and glory and blessing. Jesus, the Lamb of God, who has sacrificed his life for the salvation of all humanity, takes the scroll of judgment and opens it. 
All of heaven burst forth in rapturous praise. His victory over Satan's temptations, his death on Calvary's cross, his resurrection, his high priestly ministry provides salvation for all who choose by faith to respond to his grace. The judgment is incredibly good news for the people of God. It speaks of the end of the reign of sin and the deliverance of God's people. Can anything be more encouraging? Jesus stands out for us in the judgment. His perfect righteous life covers us. His righteousness works within us to make us new. His grace pardons us, transforms us and empowers us to live godly lives. We need not fear. Jesus stands for us in the judgment and the powers of evil are defeated. Judgment is passed in favour of the people of God, as we read in Daniel 7.22. The purpose of the judgment is not to find out how bad we are, but to reveal how good God is. And so to finish today, again dwell on the great hope that we have in the judgment, Jesus as our substitute. Why is that our only hope? Friday, April 28. Look at the powerful insights the Spirit of Prophecy gives us in regard to the state of God's people in the last days, in the time of judgment and the end of the world. And this comes from Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, pages 473 and 474. Their only hope is in the mercy of God. Their only defence will be prayer. As Joshua was pleading before the angel, so the remnant church, with brokenness of heart and earnest faith, will plead for pardon and deliverance through Jesus their Advocate. They are fully conscious of the sinfulness of their lives. They see their weakness and unworthiness, and as they look upon themselves, they are ready to despair. The tempter stands by to accuse them as he stood by to resist Joshua. He points to their filthy garments, their defective characters. He presents their weakness and folly, their sins of ingratitude, their unlikeness to Christ which has dishonoured their Redeemer. The people of God have been in many respects very faulty. Satan has an accurate knowledge of the sins which he has tempted them to commit, and he presents these in the most exaggerated light, declaring, Will God banish me and my angels from his presence and yet reward those who have been guilty of the same sins? Thou canst not do this, O Lord, in justice. Thy throne will not stand in righteousness and judgment. Justice demands that sentence be pronounced against them. But, While the followers of Christ have sinned, they have not given themselves to the control of evil. They have put away their sins and have sought the Lord in humility and contrition, and the divine advocate pleads in their behalf. He who has been most abused by their ingratitude, who knows their sin and also their repentance, declares, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. I gave my life for these souls. They are graven upon the palms of my hands. End of quote. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. One, how does the knowledge that the hour of his judgment has come in Revelation 14.7 impact our daily lives? If most of us are honest, we'd probably say that it doesn't, right? How can we change? Two, why is the judgment good news and not bad news? In class, talk about the role Jesus takes for us in the judgment. How can this motivate us to be faithful to him, knowing that only because of what he has done for us can we have the hope of salvation? And three, dwell more on the idea of the judgment revealing to the universe the character of God. How does this idea fit in very well with the whole great controversy scenario? And now it's time for Inside Story, our mission story for this week, read by Sibylla. Thank you, Sibylla. A Guy on a Bicycle by Anthony Kent On dusty outback roads through dry, monotonous terrain, and under a merciless hot Australian sun, 
Philip rode his bicycle hundreds of miles selling hope-filled Christian books as a literature evangelist. One day he came to a farm in the middle of nowhere, a place called Ugaura. Here he saw a farmer ploughing a field. The man was strong in physique but broken in spirit. It was Tom Kent. Philip didn't know it, but Tom's family was heartbroken. His wife, Mary, had succumbed to pneumonia. He was in despair and struggling to care for their 11 children. Just before her death, Mary had asked Tom to promise that he would meet her in heaven and bring the children with him. Tom had promised. Tearfully, he had looked for a Bible to see how he could keep his promise. And that's when Philip met Tom. Philip Ainsley Reeky was born in Scotland in 1846. In 1888, widowed and divorced, he migrated to Australia, looking for a new life. Just a year later, in 1889, he stumbled upon some Christian literature, discovered amazing Bible truths and encountered the real Jesus. He'd not only found a new country, but also a new reason to live. He wanted to spread hope. He quit working as an engraver so that he could engrave God's word upon hearts by becoming a literature evangelist. Now listening to Tom's heartbreaking story, Philip saw pain and heard of Mary's dying hope. He decided to share the great controversy with Tom. Tom wrestled with the biblical truths he read, but after careful study he accepted the teachings. These new discoveries gave Tom the deep comfort and assurance that he so badly needed. He shared his discoveries with his children and neighbours. His children and five neighbouring families became believers and disciples of Jesus. It was then that Tom knew he could keep his promise to his wife. Today, this remarkable story continues. Tom Kent's descendants, together with the other five families and other people brought into the Seventh-day Adventist Church, add up to more than 20,000 individuals. 20,000 lives transformed by a faithful literature evangelist on a bicycle and a farmer who shared the great controversy with his family and neighbours. Would you like to experience ultimate joy, meaning and purpose in your life? Join the Global Church in 2023 and 2024 in the mass promotion and distribution of the Great Controversy. Visit greatcontroversyproject.org for more information on or ask your pastor. Anthony Kent is great-grandson of Tom Kent and General Conference Associate Ministerial Secretary. Greetings, Sabbath School friends around the world. My name is Emma Garrick, a final year nursing student at Avondale University in Coorumbong, Australia. You have been listening to my grandfather, Percy Harold, reading the text of the Adult Bible Study Guide with this week's Sabbath School lesson. He has been doing this for free since 1996, long before I was born initially read as eyes for the visually impaired through Christian services for the blind in Australia and New Zealand. It became a podcast in July 2007, and so became available to anyone around the world. In 2021, Pa's podcast became the reading podcast for the official General Conference Sabbath School app, with daily recordings of each day of the lesson. The podcasts of the reading of the Sabbath School lessons are available from Hope Channel Australia, primarily on SoundCloud, and thence on multiple podcast rebroadcasters, including Apple iTunes. For several years, it has also been available in YouTube format, with the voice of my grandfather syncing in time with the scrolling of the text of the lesson, including all the reference texts. And for the visually impaired in the North American division, it is available on CD from Christian Record Services out of Nebraska. Hope Channel Germany distributes it to the blind in Europe. You are over one of 40,000 who listen every week around the globe. Tell your friends to look up my grandfather on the internet. It is simple. Just search for Dr. Percy Harold, select the site you want to listen to, make it a favourite on your device, and be able to listen again anytime you like. But downloading the General Conference Sabbath School app is a sure way to listen daily. That is the one with the blue rectangular icon, with a stylized globe and three angels superimposed. And, as my grandfather would say each week, Remember, God is always faithful.